23 of our people here. Uh, are we ready to start? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Elizabeth Ring on this task force from the Episcopal Diocese of Maine. And thank you for joining us for this hour of conversation about the Episcopal Church and Native American people. The conversation is being recorded and will be available for reviewing at provinceone.org very soon. I will be facilitating our conversation with the gracious assistance of James McKim Bishop Gallagher and Bishop Lane and Canon Schott will present their stories and share conversation with each other and with you, the audience. In preparation for the open conversation time, I encourage you to post your questions and comments in the chat area, which we will be monitoring and drawing from. Please remember to keep your microphone muted and your video turned off. Hopefully this hour will prompt you to dig deeper and learn more. I now invite Karen Montano to lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Creator, we give you thanks for all you are and all you bring to us for our visit within your creation. In Jesus, you place the gospel in the center of this sacred circle through which all creation is related. You show us the way to live a generous and compassionate life. Give us your strength to live together with respect and commitment as we grow in your spirit, where you are God, now and forever. Amen. 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 From the Disciples' Prayer Book. Oh, wonderful. And I believe our record light is now on. Yes, it is. Uh, so we have several wonderful speakers tonight. Bishop Gallagher will contextualize the conversation with a brief history of the Anglican Episcopal Church's relationship with Native people, explore the implications of a predominant of indigenous peoples in urban areas, yet a limited focus of the Episcopal Church and her efforts to raise up and train native leaders for the church. Bishop Lane and Canon Schott and John Diefenbaker Crail will talk about the long-standing work of the Diocese of Maine supporting the sovereignty rights of the Penobscot Nation and other Wabanaki tribes, and particularly about the groundbreaking breaking work of the Wabanaki State Child Welfare Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the efforts of Wabanaki Reach, a group that trains allies to advocate and build bridges between Native people and Maine citizens. John Diefenbacher Crail will speak briefly about the work of the Episcopal Committee on Indian Relations here in the diocese. James McKim will graciously be our timekeeper and send cues to the speakers. So welcome everyone, and Bishop Gallagher, you're on. All right, let's see if I can do this. Okay, am I on? You yes. are on. All right. Um, my name is Carol Gallagher. My um, family name is Walking Stick. My mother's name was Betty Walking Stick or Woody Oranisti. Um, she grew up in Oklahoma. I grew up mostly in New York. Um, but I have committed my ministry to working with Native people and raising up Native leadership in our church. Um, some of you may know I am the first Native woman to be elected bishop in the Episcopal Church and throughout the Anglican Communion. So because of that, that only adds to my level of responsibility and honor to be able to serve Native people in this church. I'm going to start a little bit with a history of the Episcopal Church or the Anglican Church and Native people. Um, when the first group of folks came to Jamestown in 1607 um, with a charter, a royal charter, 
the charter said that including all of their business um, efforts, they were also to bring the light of the gospel to those savages suffering in darkness. Um, 1607, um, landing in Jamestown, as some of you know the story of Jamestown, um, the first several years were very difficult and um, some of us here in Massachusetts um, have a senator who's named after um, Maatoka or Pocahontas as she's more famously known. Um, her native name is Matoka. Um, but she and her people basically not only spared the life, but saved the life of the first settlers in that part of the world, as the native people in this part of the world did likewise to the first English settlers. Um, it was about maybe 15 or 20 years um, afterwards where the Episcopal, well, our ancestor, the Anglican Church, really um, pulled away from um, considering evangelizing or being working with Native people in this part of the world, in that part of the world, anyway, in uh, Virginia, and really set about um, as a colony to destroy as many of the Native people as possible. Um, there's a famous speech by Chief Powhatan, which says something to the effect of, um, why do you come at us with guns and swords when we have offered you food and shelter? Um, so very early on, a long time ago, uh, 400 plus years ago, there's been a conflict between those who represent our church and um, at least a spiritual conflict between those who represent our church and the people, um, native people across this country. Um, we have, at this point, I serve in the Diocese of Montana, um, half time as the Bishop for Native Ministries and half time as the Bishop Missioner for the Bishop's Native Collaborative. So that means that I go around the country. Um, so from Alaska um, and North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana included, um, Central Gulf Coast, um, North Carolina, um, and a variety of other places, um, and Navajo land particularly, where I just was a couple weeks ago, um, to train folks and help them take leadership in the church. As some of you may know, the tribes in Virginia, the first tribes that welcomed our church and um, the Anglican church, um, they were just granted federal recognition. Now, these are the people that, as are the people here um, in Massachusetts and Maine and New Hampshire, Vermont and Connecticut, who um, helped the first um, illegal aliens, let's call them, um, survive on this continent. Um, many were not granted federal recognition because they had a relationship with the crown. And after um, the Revolutionary War um, and those folks who had treaties with the crown um, basically became non-existent to our federal government. The six tribes of Virginia, there are actually um, 10, but the six tribes that make up what is called sometimes the Powhatan Confederacy just were granted federal recognition and indeed the president actually did sign that into law very recently in the past couple of weeks. So um, that's a step in the right direction, but that's been very painful. Our majority populations um, in terms of the churches that we have are in um, Navajo land, North and South Dakota. Um, we have a few little congregations dotted across the country, um, but those have been few and far between. Our folks in the in Virginia, who I worked with when I was suffragan there, um, they were asked because they were seeking federal recognition. This has been going on for 25 or more years. Um, they said, well, um, in a discussion, folks said, well, why do you want recognition, you just want to be able to have casinos. And the dear friends of mine in Virginia um, said, 
um, we can't have casinos. And folks pushed them a little harder, and they said, why is that? And they said, well, we're all Baptists. Um, and indeed, they signed into their contract um, and their request for federal recognition that they would not have um, casinos. It was not for anything like that for as much as um, some autonomy, um, self-direction, and the ability to um, have the kind of social services that many of our other tribes have. So in the Episcopal Church, um, all the denominations actually, we were divided up. This is one place where there wasn't any distance between um, church and state. Um, they drew up who was going to get which group of people. Um, so there are parts of various different reservations that are com in Montana, for example. Um, it was between the Catholics and the Lutherans. So we have no reservation churches in Montana, although we have a larger um, percentage of native people in Montana than South Dakota. In North Dakota and South Dakota, the Episcopal Church got many of the churches, many of the um, churches and schools. Um, and that was the same in what is we now refer to as Navajo land. So um, those areas that the four corners would be. So um, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, um, and Utah. And so we have um, somewhere is near the largest population would probably be in Navajo land just because of that's the one group that is specifically on the reservation and has a fairly large geographic area. In South Dakota, um, probably be about the second largest population. That's partly because um, they have many reservations, but they are considerably smaller. They're not all one nation. And then we have Alaska, which has um, not reservations, but villages. And um, in Alaska, um, as our 50th state, um, corporations were set up rather than um, the traditional tribal governments, but they're very much run like a tribal government um, and would match many of our other tribal agencies. I looked on um, some resources, and particularly the federal census always is um, a curious place to go. But in province one, we have something like 132,000 native people. Um, and when I've often worked with school groups and church groups, folks will say, well, what are there? Maybe a couple dozen Native people in this particular area. One of the problems in our, this part of the world is a radical lack of awareness of who Native people are, where they are, and um, how they live, um, and those kinds of things. In the northeast region of our country, there's over 500,000 Native people. Um, and that's a significant population. We are, Native people are 1% or Indigenous people are 1% of the U.S. population or just barely 1% of the U.S. population. So that's a fairly high number of people who are hidden within our population. And one of the things I try work with both in Montana and across the church is to help people connect with folks in their communities and work with their, their local communities to begin to understand how that lack of awareness, meaning people, folks not seeing other people, how that really becomes an issue of racial justice. That we don't want to acknowledge um, as a larger population our Native people among us. And we're also the one group in this country that has to have a card um, for any of our Native people to apply for any scholarship or to be recognized as a Native person in particular places. You have to be card carrying. Um, and that would have been that your family would have been recognized during um, the time of the Dawes Commission. We're talking about 1907. Um, so again, it's a second level of racial discrimination, maybe unintentional, but folks not 
being able to have an identity or recognize for who they really are. And then um, the rest of the majority population saying, you know, how do you know you're native? Um, well, you know, you work in a hospital, how can you be native? There are a variety of different, very hard things that are said that people don't understand um, how native people live in the present day. 78% of our, the national population in the United States of indigenous people live outside of what are traditional native territories meaning um, Alaskan villages or um, on reservations. And many have, do not have um, specifically reservation land. So anyway, so our goal in the work that we're doing in the Bishop's Native Collaborative and in the work I'm doing in Montana and the work we're trying to do within the Office of Indigenous Ministries and our new missioner is the Reverend Dr. Brad Hoff, who's Lakota, is to not only um, serve and recognize and um, include Native people in our populations, but also help to educate the rest of the church on um, who we are and who we are among ourselves, you know, among us. Um, many of our folks in South Dakota who are members of um, the Episcopal Church don't go to, who may have been raised on a reservation in South Dakota or North Dakota or Montana, will not go to church even if they've lived in Boston for 30 years because many of our churches um, don't feel anything like home. So um, I think that's part of the conversation that I like to raise up is that how do we actually, one, recognize folks, see them and be among them and um, listen, but also how do we, um, as a church, do the radical invitation that we keep talking about, but we have a much harder time doing. And I'm going to finish up there. Um, Elizabeth, are we supposed to take the questions at the end? I see, I have to unmute myself. Uh, yes. Yes, I, that will, I think, work best because then we will have heard you all and heard you in dialogue to some degree with each other. Okay. So thank, thank you. you very much. Um, Bishop Lane, your turn to start from Maine. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm Steve Lane of the Diocese of Maine, and with me tonight are um, Heidi Schott, who is canon for social justice in the diocese, and John Diefenbacher Kral, who is the chair of our Committee on Indian Relations, and we're going to share this presentation. Um, Bishop Gallagher has spoken eloquently about the difficulties and the complexities of relationships with Native peoples, especially in the East where for so long people have gone without recognition and uh, even now struggle with that. Uh, and that's very true for me. Um, uh, relationships with newcomers to the continent, particularly the English, were fraught with difficulty from the very beginning and led to a long period, over a hundred years of bloody warfare between largely English settlers and native peoples. Uh, and those poor relationships continue down to our own day with um, current difficulties between the tribes and the state legislature. Um, so um, we are representative of that kind of, of difficulty. The native people of Maine are known collectively as the Wabanaki or the people of the dawn. And we Mainers like to remind everyone that the sun comes up here first. And that's not original with us Anglos. That's <laughs> the Wabanaki called themselves that long before us. And the Wabanaki are spread across Maine and Maritime Canada. And uh, our, the larger population actually in Canada. In the 17th century, the 1600s, there were about 32,000 Wabanaki, it's estimated, in Maine uh, when the English first arrived. 
Um, from 1616 to 1619, 90% of them died, mostly from disease. And ultimately, 96% of the Wabanaki died, and their 20 tribes were reduced to four. And we continue this day to have four tribes. Uh, Carol talked about registration and those issues. There are 3,500 enrolled uh, Wabanaki across the state of Maine, approximately. Um, many, many more, obviously, not enrolled. Um, there are two bands of Passamaquoddy who live in Indian Township and Point Pleasant. That's on the east side of Maine. The Holton Band of Maliseets who live up in the northern part of the state. The Penobscot Nation living uh, on Indian Island in Orono, which is kind of the middle coastal part of the state. It's where Bangor is. And then the Aroostook Band of Maliseet, uh, Mick, excuse me, of the Micmac, uh, who also live in the north. Um, most Wabanaki who are Christian are Roman Catholic, uh, primarily because relationships in the early days were much better with the French than with the English. And uh, the French, French and French Canadians are predominantly Roman Catholic. So there are Roman Catholic congregations, but not Anglican or Episcopal congregations. So Diocese of Maine has no Wabanaki congregations, and we have no ministries of uh, what I would call direct service or interaction with the tribes, uh, and nor are any wanted, actually. The Wabanaki have not been receptive to what I think we would all agree are ministries of charity. Um, so our relationship over many years has been largely what I would call, uh, uh, and I'll define this, but corporate. That is, a relationship between the diocese through our Committee on Indian Relations and the leaders of several tribes that have been kind of negotiated at that level. Uh, and uh, at their invitation, we have served as advocates in the public arena, particularly with the state legislature. And our Committee on Indian Relations has also educated Episcopalians about the realities of Wabanaki life in Maine, and some years ago produced a documentary called Invisible which got uh, uh, some good play at the time and has been shown in many of our uh, congregations. We also sponsored, uh, we were a sponsor of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission work, and um, I'm gonna ask Heidi to speak about that. Um, perhaps the matter uh, uh, that could be accounted as our best work uh, over our 25 years of work with the Wabanaki is the work done on the doctrine of discovery. And I think John D.K. will uh, speak about that. Our, general con our diocesan convention passed a resolution on the doctrine of discovery in 2007, which was referred to the general convention in 2009 and adopted there, and has now been endorsed uh, in many churches and in other bodies. So that's kind of a brief overview of things from my perspective, and let me now ask Heidi to talk about the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, Commission, and Wabanaki Reach. Okay. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me now? I, I understand that my volume was not great. Still low. Still low? Yeah, you need more volume. Uh, well, I will lean in here. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think what I'm going to do is uh, maybe after John has a chance to speak, I'll jump back in about the Truth and Reconciliation Committee or Commission and uh, Wabanaki Reach, but I do want to tell a little bit about the origins of our Committee on Indian Relations. Of, of all the committees in the Diocese of Maine, um, the Committee on Indian Relations is our most longstanding committee besides those that are canonically required, like the Standing Committee and the Commission on Ministry. So it has a long history and the, the origin is from around 1991 as the 500th anniversary of Columbus stepping on North American soil uh, approached. Um, the, a group of people in the Diocese of Maine, um, a priest named Roger Smith, who is, is still with us, um, recommended that we start to look at ways that we could uh, recognize and um, celebrate 
um, our relationships with, in the, with the Wabanaki in Maine and, and also learn a lot more about our, those neighbors. And, and so that was, uh, that was at our convention in 1991, our diocesan convention uh, that directed the bishop to pull together a task force or a committee. And that committee, uh, which was first known in 1993 as the Native American Committee, uh, in 1995, its name was changed to the Committee on Indian Relations. So we're, we're looking at many, many years here of, of work. Um, and their, their, their take has sort of changed over the years. I'm going to read their mission statement that was developed about 10 years ago um, that I think is particularly lovely. And that is, we are called by our Creator to deepen our relationship with the Wabanaki of Maine, to stand with the tribes in the pursuit of justice, to affirm their inherent sovereignty, and to support the preservation of native languages and culture. Um, so that's what they've been, that's what they work at. And um, I want to introduce John Diepenbacher Kral, who um, for many years served uh, as the um, executive director of the Maine Indian Tribal State Commission. He's currently at the University of Maine. And he preached a sermon in 2006 at St. James Old Town, where he's a member, um, that introduced the notion of repudiating the doctrine of discovery from 15, or 1496. Um, that got some traction within the Committee on Indian Relations. And in 2007, shortly before Bishop Lane came to be with us, uh, that was passed at our diocesan convention. Um, I, I remember the following year writing letters to the Queen of England and uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury um, um, seeking to announce our repudiation of, of John Cabot's charge to go forth. And, um, and of course it got traction at the General Convention in 2009 and has been adopted by many denominations over the past um, 10 years, including uh, the Quakers, the World Council of Churches, the United Methodists, um, some Roman Catholic dioceses, um, uh, the United Church of Christ, and the Lutherans. So uh, what started in Old Town, Maine uh, has really had a, a life. So I'd like to introduce John and have him uh, tell us a little bit about um, not only the, the repudiation of the document of discovery, but also the work of the Committee on Indian Relations as it stands today. Well, thanks for that intro, Heidi. You took a little bit of my remarks, but I think it sounded better coming from you. I just want to note for everyone that Bishop Lane appointed me last February 15th to be the chair of the committee. I had been involved for a dozen or more years, very active. And as Heidi noted, I was the executive director of the Maine Indian Tribal State Commission until last year. I still do consulting work for the commission. And I was also the diocese's uh, official representative at the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues in 2012. During the latter half of my work at the Maine Indian Tribal State Commission, something really crystallized for me. What is the heart of this conflict between the Wabanaki the state of Maine and United States, and it's colonialism. Uh, we're supposed to live in a post-colonial period, um, and some people might point to the UN General Assembly's resolution adopted in 1960, a uh, declaration on the granting of independence to colonial countries and peoples. Um, it reads in part, concerned that indigenous people, well, this is, uh, this is actually from the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Concern that Indigenous peoples have suffered from historic injustices as a result of inter alia, their colonization and dispossession of their lands, territories, and resources, thus preventing them from exercising, in particular, their right to development in accordance with their own needs and interests. And that's what happens every single day in the state of Maine and what the Wabanaki face. There's inexorable, constant pressure to eradicate the tribes as distinct peoples. And that's what Wabanaki peoples face and what we're trying to uh, ameliorate uh, the best we can. And thank you, 
Heidi for reading our mission statement. Uh, we're very uh, proud of that mission statement and that guides us in our work. And to carry out that mission, we're focused on building and nurturing formal working relationships with the five Wabanaki tribal governments. Also educating ourselves so that we can be better informed and effective allies and advocating when we adequately understand the Wabanaki position on issues to advance their inherent self-determination. We also celebrate Wabanaki and indigenous cultural, intellectual, and athletic accomplishments and work to deepen settler appreciation of the varied Wabanaki indigenous contributions to our lives and our existence. Where our work in ministry has been different than what some other Episcopalians have done, and Bishop Lane noted this, is we've not focused on evangelizing or incorporating Wabanaki people into our worship. We always feel blessed when the Wabanaki share some practice or ritual with us, but as you heard from our mission, we see in part its implementation as creating the space and recognition for Wabanaki peoples to practice their spirituality. A manifestation of that commitment is the committee's long-standing financial support of the K-100, the annual spiritual trek held every Labor Day weekend, which spirit athletes run, paddle, bike, walk, and combination thereof from Indian Island to Mount Katahdin, a very sacred place for the Wabanaki peoples. The distance from Indian Island to Mount Katahdin is 100 miles, thus the name of the event. And colonialism restricts Wabanaki access to Mount Katahdin and requires them, as if they were any other group, to pay to camp there. So the Committee on Indian Relations pays the camping fee to mitigate in some small way the injustice of the Baxter State Park Authority requiring them to pay to access their spiritual site. Imagine if we had to pay to access our cathedrals or churches. During the last three months, the entire committee met with Penobscot Nation Tribal Ambassador Molly and Dana to learn more about this newly created position and how the committee and the Penobscot Nation, especially through Ambassador Dana, can work more closely together. That meeting was preceded by a delegation from the Committee on Indian Relations meeting with Penobscot Chief Kirk Francis last October. Last week, as I noted, I was accompanied by Marilyn Roper from the Friends Committee on Maine Public Policy, a Quaker group, and we met with Chief Clarissa Sabatis and Counselor Kathy St. John, and then went up to Presque Isle and met with the Aroostook Band of Micmacs Tribal Government and Chief Peter Paul. And we're working on similar meetings with the Passamaquoddy leaders in Washington County. We're discussing with Wabanaki leaders some initiatives to educate main decision makers and the main populace at large to elevate issues affecting Wabanaki main relations in the public consciousness, thereby hoping to catalyze political action on them. Though we are eager to move forward on these initiatives as we see the need to create a political mandate for change is urgent, we won't do anything in without the full support of the five Wabanaki tribal governments. Thank you. Wonderful. Katie, did you want to say something more about the? Uh, did you want to say something about reach? Yeah, yeah. Let me uh, let me jump in there a little bit. Um, thanks, John. Um, I think one of the things that that I found most useful in learning about the five tribes was um, about I believe in 2011 we wrote um, a new opportunities grant for the Episcopal Church to uh, essentially do a bus trip from Augusta, our state capital, and take legislators to Indian Island, where at the home of Penobscot Nation, and meet with the five chiefs and some other um, representatives of the tribes to just be able to allow the legislators to ask questions and to, to learn from the chiefs, figure out what was going on, figure out what their needs were, um, figure out how, and I, 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 John, I don't think you were on that trip, but um, I think that was probably one of the, the better things that, that, that at least from the, 
not the committee exactly, but from the support that the diocese can offer um, by you know, having the Episcopal Church support that um, it was a very eye-opening experience. I think both for members of um, the committee who were able to attend, but also I think we had about a dozen um, or 15 legislators from across the state who came and got to sit with the five chiefs. Um, interesting stuff, really learned a lot about the challenges and the, the, the history of the tribes. For example, in the, uh, we had a huge ice storm in 1998 and their take on the blankets that were sent um, to the, to the uh, I believe it was to the Penobscot Nation, the just in terms of the generations of um, um, suspicion of what blankets that were sent um, would mean in terms of disease. I mean, when you have the, the, the sort of the memory and the institutional history and what, um, I think it's uh, Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart uh, in the 80s coined as uh, intergenerational trauma, which uh, is, you know, sort of the long, long-term historical trauma that is, is in the hearts and minds, continues to be in the hearts and minds of people. And they said, it, you know, even as, early, as late as 20 years ago, you know, you send us blankets, we're not going to use them. And so I think that, that was, a, that was a, just one of the really interesting things that came out of that visit to Indian Island with the legislators. Um, so in, in 1998, or uh, yeah, 1978, um, Congress passed the, the Indian Child Welfare Act. And it wasn't until 1999 that the state representatives in Maine and the, the Department of Human Services even invited the tribes to see how that they might help um, the state government live into the Child Welfare Act. So it took, it took a long, long time for something like the Truth and Reconcil Reconciliation Committee to uh, come into play in the state of Maine. Uh, it had been done in uh, a Truth and Reconciliation Committee or commission similar to what was done in South Africa under um, uh, Bishop Tutu, Archbishop Tutu um, after apartheid uh, happened in Atlanta, Canada. I believe it also happened in, um, they, they also conducted one in Iowa, but it took a long, long time for Maine to kind of come around to um, the appalling uh, rate of removal of Native children from their families. I'm gonna, I've got a quote here from the former chief of uh, the Maliseet, um, the Holton Bend of Maliseet. She reported that in 1999, 16% of all Maliseet children were in state custody. Um, the disproportionate taking of our children threatened the survival of our tribe. Um, this went on for years and years and years, from the late 1800s through the 50s, and even into the 90s, even after the um, Indian Child Welfare Act, um, there was a disproportionate number of Native children being put in foster care. Um, and so the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that slowly evolved, um, there was a first talk of uh, a declaration of intent as early as 2010, and then in 2012, the governor and the chiefs of the five tribes uh, signed uh, the, the commission into, uh, into effect. And uh, one of the commissioners, a woman named Carol Wishcamper, has been a good friend of the Diocese of Maine, and she has invited, she invited us into, into the work. Um, so from 2013 uh, through 2015, uh, they had listeners, people who would listen not only to people who had been put into foster care as children um, or adopted by families through Department of Human Services, um, they also listened to um, Department of Human Services caseworkers and administrators who had been a part of that. So they, they listened to everybody to tell their story about what it was like and what it meant to either go into care, be taken from their families. Um, and it, a very powerful process. And through all this, they, they did give their report in June of 2015. Um, and then the work and the mandate that came through this process, and I'd be happy to share the link for the full report, which is 
fascinating and heartbreaking um, with any participants who are interested, I can share that with Julie. Um, that work went on to be, uh, to be implemented and pursued by an organization called Wabanaki Reach. Um, and they have done a lot of ally trainings, including some trainings um, in, a, in Episcopal churches uh, to, to help people who are not members of the tribe uh, to become allies for, for the Wabanaki, in much in the way that the, the Committee on Indian Relations has been doing for the last 25, 26 years. So, um, Time warning. Okay, thank you. Um, Thanks, Heidi. But we can, we, can, we can flesh this out through some of the Q&A if you have some more questions. But um, uh, th there's a great quote. I will give you a great quote. Um, and this is from a young uh, Clinkett activist. It's not, I don't know if it's actually happened here in Maine, but it's a quote from that report. And I have a great nephew who's a member of the Clinkett tribe from Alaska, um, who's rocking it at Columbia right now as a freshman. We're so proud of him. And he is just the pride of his tribe in Southeast Alaska. Um, but the quote is, the shortest distance between two people is a story. And maybe it's my communications background, but I think that's a, that's a powerful, powerful way to think about um, how we can be good allies to the main tribes. Thanks, Thank Heidi. You've all given us a great deal of rich material. And there are some questions that uh, Karen is organizing coming through the chat. Do you have anything, would you like to take a couple of minutes to talk back and forth amongst each other and do you have questions for each other presenters? I, I had a question for Carol actually. Um, I was struck Carol by um, the number of folks who self-identify as Native American in um, Maine, 132,000 I think you reported or the census reports and there are 3,500 enrolled in the five bands so the, dif the difference is staggering and are, are most of those folks somehow no longer connected with the tribes or just not enrolled, just not registered? No, I actually, I said in province one, there were 132,000. Oh, 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 I'm, so I I'm sorry if you misheard me. But in Maine alone, there are 18,000 plus people who um, in the census identify themselves as native. Um, more than likely, one of the challenges is many of Native people, Indigenous people, are not members of the main tribes. So the main tribes aren't counting them. Okay? Um, and that's one of our challenges because many of our tribal people, um, there's not a lot of our traditional Native areas, there's not a lot of work, let's be honest. Um, and education. I mean, you know, I served Heidi in Sitka, Alaska, where the Clinkets, um are. And um, so I can tell you that, you know, we send our best and brightest off to New York City and to Boston and to these places, you know. And many times it's impossible for them to go home. So um, that's one of the, the challenges we have because they can find employment, they can teach somewhere. You know, I have a dear friend who um, teaches at Yale, um, but she's from Alabama. But she can't be employed as, you know, she's one of our best and brightest, but she can't be employed at home. You know, there's no way for her to teach there. So I just say that to you to so everybody is aware that part of the population, they may be enrolled, but they may not be enrolled in a tribe in Maine or Vermont or New Hampshire or Massachusetts because of dislocation is a huge issue and that's part of the um, you know the ongoing um, intergenerational trauma you have to choose to move away from your folks you know and then try to be home and back and forth and that's you know complicated so so are we ready to address some of the questions that have, or comments that have come through Sure. I'll just um, um, kind of go through them. Um, one comment had to do with, um, I believe, the registration of Native people 
being um, like blood quantum of um, like animals like horses and dogs. Um, it put me in mind of the past books or papers that you had to have to move from community to community in the uh, communities of African descent. There is a question about what would church, what would making church look home, look church like home look like? Um, a question I think is for you, John, about whether they're Wampan, um, yeah, Wampanaki on the board or members. And then a very challenging question that um, speaks of um, skirting around the issue that the Anglican Church, the Episcopal Church, had a hand in um, destroying families and um, kidnapping, incarcerating, so to speak, um, Native children. I think, Heidi, you did speak some to that. And two more messages, a message um, from the Episcopal Church in Connecticut. Um, and there are questions. Karen, I'm going to suggest we actually handle some of these questions instead of reading them all off. So uh, maybe we go back to that. So I just question. So John, I'm James, I was just letting people know what is there. So we can certainly start um, with the first question. Right. So I think the first question there is really about uh, making the church feel like home. What does, right. what does that mean? What does that feel like? And is that the right thing to do even uh, based on yeah. some of the things we've been dealing with at the uh, at EDCAR on the national level? That's a question. Is it even the right thing to try to make our church feel like home for others? I think I'm going to take a stab at it because um, I was the person that said that. Um, home is a place where your story is heard and where your voice is heard. That's really the intentionality I had. So, um, you know, Native people who are Episcopalians, let's say they come to Boston um, to go to college or to teach or to work. Um, I'm just picking on Boston um, <laughs> because I can. Uh, <laughs> we do too. It's all right. <laughs> anyway, um, there are a lot of our Episcopal churches that kind of unintentionally require a certain posture and privilege and dressy upness. And, you know, um, I had a hard time when I came to seminary um, finding a place to worship in Boston. That was a long, that was a hundred years ago. I get it, but um, it's still pretty hard. And um, you know, many of our people, what I'm trying to encourage, for example, in Montana is this isn't about evangelism. This is about opening the church up for other sort of resources, for meetings, for gatherings, for um, listening sessions, for a variety of different things that, um, folks haven't even thought about. So um, that's what home's all about is on most of our reservations in, in our smaller communities, they're used for everything. So you get fed there. I'm not talking about con tiny little tea sandwiches, maybe or a couple cookies. I'm talking about real yes. meals where people sit down together. So I guess that's my sense of that. So I get this. That means being known. Yeah. Um, being known. Seen. Um, Seen. Uh -huh. Acknowledged. I think I would say in Maine, we have not had it as a goal in any meaningful way to try to pull Native peoples into Episcopal churches, in part because we recognize how toxic the history is and how, um, how difficult the history is. And even if uh, it's true that in some ways we have repented of that behavior, the memory is long, and we don't I think it's not our place to determine whether or not we would be a safe place for folks to come. What we have done is agree to work with the leadership, in particular advocacy things, and that's what they have said is important. So um, 
uh, I'm sure there are places where uh, Wabanaki folks attend church on occasion, but we have not, that really hasn't been a goal of our ministry over the last 25 years. Uh, and in, and in, in some ways, I think it's been kind of an act of repentance all along. That we're, we're doing what we can using our access to power at the state level to provide assistance without expecting a lot of warm fuzzies um, or close relationships at the parochial level. I don't know, John might comment on that, but um, that's my sense. No, you're right, Steve. We've been told very directly by top leaders of the tribes, what we need you to do is help fight for our right to self-determination. Because as I said, there's this inexorable pressure every second of every day uh, to eradicate the tribes as distinct political entities. I think, you know, the people may exist as human beings, but as distinct indigenous peoples, that's really under threat every single day. Uh, a question was asked, are there any Wabanaki people involved in the committee? Yes. Well, we think that's really important. It's been primarily Penobscot. We're especially blessed to have Butch Phillips, former Penobscot tribal representative to the Maine legislature, lieutenant governor, and spiritual leader for the Penobscot Nation is very active in our group. We've had other Penobscot elders like Arnie Neptune and Wadey Akins involved in our group, but that's partly why I'm out on the road meeting with the other tribes. I want us to have equally strong relationships with the other three tribes in Maine. So the Penobscots have hosted our meetings many times over the last couple of decades. We enjoy a really easy and great access to Penobscot leaders. Uh, we want to see that with all the tribes. Thank Can you. I just jump in and ask a quick question? Uh, John, there were some in 1992, we held a service in the National Cathedral, Celebration of Survival of Native People. And there was a man from Maine, I think he was a member of that committee, whose name was Alan. I know he's passed away several years ago. Um, but I'm not remembering his last name. But for a long time, there was some connection, more direct connection with some of the work that was going on in the National Church, or the tech or however we want to refer to our church. Um, but I know that one of the things that I have really been trying to um, advocate for is that there's actually a larger conversation and that we have our Eastern tribes, um, those of us who are involved in the Episcopal Church, have conversations together. And I'm wondering if um, you all would be open to that, something like that. Well, thank you, Carol. We have tried to connect. I thought I had a pretty strong working relationship with Janine Tinsley Rowe. So did um, I. Yeah. I. I feel like um, it wasn't great with Sarah Eagleheart, and I actually think there were issues about who claims what about the Doctrine of Discovery work. I'll just leave it at that. That was okay. difficult. Um, Very difficult, yep. So I'm, I'm delighted. I'm delighted to meet you tonight. And I, I think, you know, if we can strengthen our mission by being more connected with national efforts, I'm all for it. I'm for, I, I want to, you know, fight for that mission of ours. Again, I just really feel urgency about that colonial pressure on these tribal governments every single day to eradicate them. And I'm right, and I'm right there with you because, I mean, after my work and the ongoing work in with the tribes in Virginia, they were in the 50s voted that they were not either, they had no distinction. So basically they were, it was cultural and personal genocide. Mm -hmm. So they could either be mulatto or colored, um, that was it. Um, so that they were never even counted as a group of people. Um, so their fight has been incredible. And, um, you know, I've been working with the folks in Cherokee, North Carolina, who just lost their church. Um, but, you know, the, um, I think that however we loosely or, you know, organized we do it to really raise the awareness of what's going on and what is ongoing, particularly in our Eastern um, states. We have a, there's something like 500,000 Native people in the New York City area. I mean, it, you know, and nobody is even acknowledging their needs. So. Quick yes or no question uh, has been posted. Can Native Americans vote? 
Uh, yes, we got the right to vote in 19... 24, I believe, we would, did not get the right to vote until after women got the right to vote in the U.S. But the shameful history in Maine, Maine was the last state to grant yes. Wabanaki people the right to vote was 1967. In state elections. Yeah. Well, and I would say, the other thing I would say is that um, we don't have federal recognition here. We have a settlement in its place. And while there's some there's some history around that. Uh, it seems to me it easily gets violated by the state. The state gets to interpret that settlement as it chooses. And in just, I think, was it last year, John, or the year before that, it was last year that the, the, the native, uh, the Wabanaki representatives at the state uh, in the legislature walked out because their fishing rights were, were not being recognized. That and a whole list of things. Yeah, actually, it was two years ago, but you're right. The yeah. Penobscot gotten passed and Plotty withdrew their representatives to the main legislature. Right. Now states retain their legislator. I, I want to I yeah. say one quick thing, though. The Maine Episcopal Network for Justice has been doing a lot of work with asset-based community development. And I, I just want to tell a quick, very quick story about the assets that Native American spirituality have to share with the rest of the church. And that, that stems from a time when Episcopal communicators met in Salt Lake City. And at our closing Eucharist, um, a couple uh, native priests were on hand and, and, and um, celebrated the Eucharist with us and had a healing ceremony. And I was, for some reason, I think I was on the board at the time I was tasked with running the CD player. So I was able to see everybody as they came up to have a moment of healing, I was able to, to, to be up close for that. And I think just, just watching my colleagues whom I love tell whatever it is they needed to tell to the clergy who were there to be with us, just those moments, I have no idea what was going on or what they were saying, but just the, the intense listening that they received um, by being laid on, you know, have their hands laid on them was, was, I think, something I've never experienced in the church before. And I think what Native clergy have to offer the church, I wish there was a way that we could, we could learn more from that. And, and We are about to run out of time. But, uh, I want to, I, we have a little flexibility on our closing moment here. Uh, someone has raised the question, uh, because they come from, some history in South Dakota, uh, asking about the economic and health situation of Native people in New England, in our diocese here in New England. And obviously we have some potential for some very specific information from the Diocese of Maine, but also, Carol, I think you bring a lot of wisdom from throughout the province. So can you chime in on that in two or three minutes and then we'll have our closing prayer. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what I, okay. Am I, I will answer quickly that it, it's kind of a mess. Um, it's so different for each of the states and if you live in Connecticut, um, some of the churches have really made huge statements against um, anti-gambling statements and anti-casino statements and things like that. Uh, my sister had the opportunity for about five years to work for the Mashantucket Pequot um, as the director of program for the museum. And it is one of the best museums, um, tribal museums in the country. Um, because of their ability to have casinos. It's a very small tribal group, but because of that, their level of recognition, they were able to do, um, have that autonomy to have casinos. It has created a problem, um, but many people perceive that, you know, they have casinos, everybody's wealthy and all that kind of stuff. Actually, most of our tribes are, if they have casinos, are turning it back into social services which they can't get elsewhere. Um, and the first time, as someone who's grown up on the East Coast, mostly, the first time I was able 
ever able to go to Indian Health Services when I lived in Sitka, Alaska, because there are no Indian Health Services available to any of us um, in this part of the world, for the most, for the most part. part. Thank you. Um, any quick words about that situation from Maine? Yeah, I'll say the Maine Indian Tribal State Commission has said the Maine Indian Claims Settlement Act is, you know, contributing to the demise of Wabanaki peoples. And, you know, there any health indicator, if you want to talk about life expectancy, it's decades shorter for Wabanaki people than other population groups. The incidence of diabetes, smoking, the uh, per capita income, I mean, they're just, but the tribes are at the bottom of every one of those indicators. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I hate to cut this off, but this has been a very important conversation. There's much more to be said than we can begin to cover in our hour. I hope this will lead everyone to more exploration, conversation, and action as we grow into deeper friendships and advocacies with our Native American neighbors. I believe James has a couple of comments and announcements, and then Karen will close us with prayer. This has been recorded, and it will be available for you to look at again uh, on the Province One website very soon. Great. Well, well uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for, for uh, facilitating this, uh, this wonderful discussion um, with our guests. Uh, so as, uh, as Elizabeth said at the beginning, this is our monthly webcast uh, brought to you by the Province One Multicultural Awareness and Cultural Competency Task Force. And so for the next uh, couple of, next three months, we've identified the topics that we'd like to cover um, starting with on March 20th, uh, we have the topic of Latino ministries, and we are grateful to have a former member of our task force, uh, Deacon Emma Rosar Nordlam, to, uh, to share with us what's going on in uh, Latino ministries. Uh, for the April 17th uh, webcast, we are, have the topic of New Americans, and as we all are aware, there's a lot going on with uh, the world of immigration these days and we want to explore that and some of the initiatives that various churches around the province are uh, um, embarking in um, and, and uh, especially around becoming uh, shelters and uh, safe spaces for uh, new americans and then on may 15th our currently scheduled last uh, webcast for the, the program year if you'd call it that before we break for the summer uh, we're going to be talking about implicit bias and uh, really trying to hone in on um, the causes for um, racism uh, that are really built into us biologically. And then we spring from that knowledge uh, to addressing how we uh, control our behavior, even though we have implicit bias baked into us because of bi our biology. So that's what's coming up for the, the rest of uh, our uh, calendar year for these webcasts and we always look forward to hearing from you all uh, what you'd like to have us uh, have sessions about um, or if you want to have us connect you with anyone who's been on any of our previous webcasts um, or anything that's up and coming please make sure that you uh, get in touch with us through the province one website and uh, we will certainly get back to you and um, and uh, consider those. Uh, I know we have a number of questions that were raised during the, the session um, at uh, the chat, in the chat, and we'll take a look at those and try to get those uh, responses to those questions out to you based on comments from, uh, from Carol and uh, Bishop Lane and, and uh, Ken and Schott. So with that, um, thank you all for coming and I'll turn it over to Karen for a closing prayer. Let us pray. God, our creator, you see us, your children, growing up in an unsteady and confusing world. Show us that your ways give more life than the ways of the world, and that following you is better than chasing after selfish goals. Help us to take failure not as a measure of our worth, but as a chance for a new start. Give us strength to build our faith in you, and to keep alive our joy in your creation. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Peace. Thank you all. Go in peace.